Okay. Hi, Karen. How are you? Hey, Christian. Good. How are you? Doing great. So great to have you here on this rainy Monday here in uh, in Napa. And uh, but we're still going to make Monday fun day, right? Yes, we are. Yeah. We certainly are. So we're today gonna... is Monday fun day. <laughs> Monday fun day, and we're back here with another uh, installment of wine trivia. Uh, so Karen's put together a really great um, twenty questions. Uh, for you guys to noodle on. One thing I'd like to ask you, though, is that when you're typing in your response, go ahead and type in the correct response rather than using the letter uh, that corresponds to that response. That'll just help us track all the correct uh, and incorrect answers. So with that, Karen, I'm going to hand it over to you. Uh, you're going to be in the driver's seat and okay. asking all the questions. So, All right. Yeah. Well, that sounds great. Okay. Thanks, Christian. Ready, set, right. and go. Go. So welcome everybody to our Monday fun day trivia, wine trivia. And today I chose bubbles. I chose sparkling wine. It's kind of a gloomy day here in Napa and we're still in semi lockdown and thought, boy, we need something to celebrate with. So we just make the day more festive. So today it's all about the bubbles. So find out if you are in fact the bubble head you think you are. Okay. So uh, let's get started right away with our first question. So during secondary fermentation, the yeast breaks down and releases proteins and other compounds. What is this process called? Is it A, batonnage, sir, B, surly aging, C, yeast autolysis, or D, disgorgement? And if you could actually write the answer in the chat box rather than just the letter, so batonnage, surly aging, yeast autolysis, or disgorgement when the yeast breaks down in secondary fermentation, releases proteins, gives all those pastry brioche aromas, sort of like that baking bread kind of thing, gives richness, texture. What do they think, Christian? Yeast. Okay. All right. Well, that's right. Yeah. So Christian is telling me that you guys are starting off with a bang and there's lots of smarty pants out there. So yes, it is yeast autolysis. This is where the yeast starts to break down. It almost, they, some people refer to it as sort of self-digesting or disintegrating. And it does give off aromas and flavors, just like you would smell um, and taste in baking bread or in pastries. Um, and it also adds that creamy sort of elastic texture, that weight on the palate. So um, disgorgement is when we pop the cork out uh, before we uh, finish it off with a cork and regular cork and uh, cage. So we get the is how we get the yeast out. Batonnage is a process when we make still wine and we actually stir the dead yeast cells back into the wine during the aging process. Um, and that aging process is called surly aging. So you have that's, but those are done with regards to still wine. The yeast autolysis happens in the bottle when making fine champagnes, wonderful champagnes. All righty, how about question two? What is the difference between sect and Deutscher sect? Is it the A, the amount of residual sugar, the type of the grape, the method of production, or where the grapes came from? So sect versus Deutscher sect. Amount of residual sugar, type of the grape, method of production, or where the grapes came from? What do you guys think? Who knows their German sparkling wines out there? For those of you WSET students, this is, uh, I think, at the level two book. So if you're a level two student, this is something you need to know. For sure, it's a level three. It's a little more detail, but there's a level. They do talk about it in level three with more detail. So. Yes, I know it sounds like that, doesn't it? Because sect kind of talks about, you know, makes you want to say sugar, refers to, could refer to sweetness, but it does not refer to sweetness. Um, and it does not refer to the type of the grape. In fact, in most cases, uh, sect and Deutscher sect are most often made uh, from Riesling because they're made in Germany and that is usually the grape of choice. 
Um, method of production for sect is always tank method. For Deutscher sect could be either, but it's where the grapes come from that is the biggest difference. So with sect, even though this is a wine that is finished in Germany and bottled in Germany, the grapes can actually come from France or Italy. A portion of them anyway, where when it says Deutscher sect, Deutscher referring to Germany itself, all of the grapes have to come from Germany. So there you have it, Deutscher sect. All righty. What is the term for the finished, finished mixture of sugar and wine that we put into a champagne that determines the sweetness level of any sparkling wine, really, not just champagnes. So the mixture of sugar and wine that we put in at the end, once we've taken the yeast out, what is that called? Is that autolysis? Liqueur de expedition? Liqueur, liqueur de tirage? Or assemblage? What do we think? What determines the sweetness of a sparkling wine. Autolysis, liqueur de expedition, liqueur de tirage, or assemblage. Those are all great sparkling wine terms, and we'll talk about all of them once we get the answer here. So one of them we kind of just talked about, so maybe you can eliminate that one. What are we thinking here, Christian? So it's it's uh, tirage seems to be the overwhelming uh, response, but there is some people who put um, expedition and uh, assemblage as well. Okay, great. Well, so uh, Christian's just whispering in my ear here about the results, and it uh, seems like tirage won the day, but it really is liqueur de expedition. That is the correct answer. Uh, autolysis, we talked about, that's when the yeast starts to break down when you're making sparkling wine. Liqueur de tirage is what the... Um, when you start to make sparkling wine, champagne in particular in the bottle, well, you, you basically make still wine, you put it in a bottle, and now in order to get the bubbles, so we have another round of bubbles, we have to add a little bit of sugar and a little bit of yeast. And that we is the liqueur de tirage, and we add that to uh, the wine to the bottle, and then we put a cork in it, and it starts to re-ferment. And it's those bubbles that's why we call it secondary fermentation because we've already fermented the wine once to a still wine. Secondary fermentation takes place in the bottle for champagne, and that's where we put this liqueur de tirage to start that secondary fermentation, so the yeast can eat. Eat, consume the sugar that we're adding. Um, the assemblage is the basically the blending of uh, the wine, the still wine, before we put it into bottles. So we may blend varietals, we may blend different oak treatments, that type of thing. So that would be the assemblage. Okay, so liqueur de expedition. Great, moving on to the next question. All righty, so... Let's talk about American wines. So, so, so here in the U.S., so which of these two U.S. regions are best known, best known for sparkling wine, best known? Carneros, Napa Valley, Amador County, or Anderson Valley? And there is there are two answers for the best. It's not to say we can't make sparkling wine in all of these places. But the two regions, think cool climate, you know, we're looking at Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, so which of these are the coolest climate? What do you think? Carneros, Napa, Amador, or Anderson? <clears throat> what do we think? Put your, put your climate hat on for a minute and think about where these are located. Okay. Okay. All righty. So it seems to me like you guys are a little over the board, but a lot of right answers. So the two correct answers are Carneros and Anderson Valley. Um, I kind of threw Napa Valley in there as a little bit of a curveball. Carneros is the only region that actually straddles both Napa and Sonoma. It is our most southerly region here in Napa. And it is right up against that cool San Pablo Bay. So the Carneros region, whether it's in Napa or Sonoma, which regardless of which side, is known as a cool climate region, perfect for Chardonnays and Pinot Noirs. 
Um, there are lots of areas of Napa Valley where you cannot grow Pinot Noir and even Chardonnay would struggle some of those warmer climates. You need, you want a cool climate because you want to uh, retain acidity and cool climates help the wine stay vibrant. You need that refreshing acidity in a sparkling wine. Um, so parts of Napa aren't really appropriate. And Amador County, although famous for Zinfandel and Barbera and a few other things, is really way too warm for uh, sparkling wine. Anderson Valley, part of Mendocino County up north, very cool climate, lots of influence from the Pacific Ocean, lots of good champagne houses from France up there, like Louis Roederer, in fact, has a, a champagne house there. So there you have it. All righty, what's next? Oh, I love this question. So what was Dom Perignon originally hired to do? Was he hired to find a way to capture bubbles in the bottle, like we see in Champagne? Was he hired to find a way to stop bubbles from forming in the bottle? Was he hired to beat Madame Clicquot to market with sparkling wines? Or was he hired to improve sparkling wine production techniques? So Dom Perignon, the famous Dom Perignon, everybody knows his wine, you've certainly heard his name. Was he finding a way to capture bubbles in the bottle to make champagne? Was he trying to stop the bubbles from happening? Was he trying to beat Madame Clicquot to the market? Or was he hired to improve the production techniques of sparkling wine? What do we think? I don't know, Christian, I don't hear the Jeopardy music, so I don't know if we're getting that today. Okay. Most people, oh, good. That's exactly right. And a lot of people, you know, I have a lot of smarties on board today, I can tell. It is B. Um, so it is, uh, he was not hired to find a way to capture the bu bubbles. It was actually, uh, the wines were being stored in cellars at the time, or down in caves rather. And in, you know, this is back before there were a lot of filtration techniques and really modern, there were no modern day winemaking techniques. So what would happen is they'd, they'd put the Pinot Noirs and the Chardonnays down in the, in the cellar or in the cave, um, you know, upon bottling. And then they would sit in this cave over the winter where it was nice and cold. And then in the spring, it would just start to warm up enough. And there was just enough, um, yeast and things that because we didn't filter it out back then that would actually the warmth would start would restart fermentation and what would happen is that the bottles would start exploding because we're not putting them in these big heavy champagne bottles we didn't even know about champagne at the time so we're just putting them in a normal thickness of bottle and the bottles were exploding so uh, they called for Dom Perignon who was a noted chemist and came down and said stop this from happening it's ruining our wine and lo and behold, uh, I, I forget the king now, but some king says, hey, this is kind of fun. I like it. So let's keep going. And from that point on, Dom Perignon was actually working toward improving the techniques. But originally, he was hired to stop the bubbles uh, from forming in the bottle. Okay. Which of these is not true? Speaking of Madame Clicquot, which of these is not true about the Madame V. Clicquot? She invented the riddling rack. She tinted her rosé wines with elderberry juice for color. She made the first vintage champagne and she or she was the first woman to run a champagne house, which is not true. So if three of these things are true, one of them is not. Did she invent the riddling rack, use elderberry juice for color, made the first vintage champagne or was the first woman to run a champagne house? Madame Clicquot, the famous, wonderful Madame Clicquot. That gorgeous yellow bottle that we all know so well. All you have to do is see that bottle and you want to celebrate something, right? Okay. Yes. Okay. Very, very good. Yes. Uh, so that is actually, you. You. I, I hear that the number one answer was that she tinted her ro rosé wines with elderberry juice. That is actually correct. Uh, there were actually some people doing that in her time, though, and she was the first one 
to use Pinot Noir, but she used still Pinot Noir at that time uh, to tint her uh, her rosé sparkling wines. Uh, but there were people doing it, making rosé. She was not the first to make a rosé wine. The first were using elderberry juice. But she was, she did invent the Riddling Rack. She was the first to create a vintage champagne. And of course, she was the first woman to run a champagne house. God bless her. Okay. All righty. So if you've heard of Cap, uh, Cap Classique, where is Cap Classique made? In the world of wine regions, where is Cap Cla Classique made? Is it made in Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or Chile? Cap Classique. What do you think? Australia, New Zealand, South Africa, or Chile? I just realized with all four of these answers, they're all Southern Hemisphere. So Cap Classic, what do we think? And I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question. I'm just gonna throw a bonus round in here. What do we think? South Africa, yes, so most of you got it right. Yes, the answer is South Africa. Um, and uh, so my bonus question is, is Cap Classique made in the traditional method, like we make in, like we use in Champagne, or is it made in the tank or Charmat method? We interchangeably call them either tank or Charmat. So just type your answer uh, in the chat box. I don't have an actual question to pop up, but is it traditional or tank? What do you guys think? Okay. Sing the Jeopardy song. <laughs> All right. What are we thinking? Oh. Christian is supposed to be speaking in my ear. There you are. Oh, okay. Oh, uh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> I can't hear it. So, <laughs> oh, sorry. We're sort of. Yeah. Okay, great. Well, um, Christian says that the overwhelming response was response was traditional, and you would be correct. It is made in the traditional method. Although traditional, actually, any one of these regions, uh, you could say, make a uh, traditional method, although many of them also make tank method or, or transfer method as well. So, okay, next question. Put these in order of dryness. So I know this is going to take a minute. So I'll give you an extra minute to write these in. Uh, these are not in the correct order. So when we're talking about sparkling wines and champagnes, there is an order of dryness to sweetness. So give me the dry first and the sweet last. So put these in the correct order of dryness. We have a choice of brut, extra dry, extra brut, brut nature. What do you think? Some of these, you know, there's a couple on here that are very common. I don't know if you like sugar in your sparkling wines, but I like mine as dry as I can get them. And keep in mind too, when a sparkling wine is very dry, it tends to you have a more noticeable acidity because sweetness balances acid. Okay, all right, well, to start off with, I'll tell you, the, the word extra, so here's your correct order, brut, nature, extra brut, brut, and extra dry. So oddly enough, the extra dry is low man on the totem pole here. It is, it is not, you know, I always think, well, gee, extra dry should be the absolute driest, of course, right? Um, but no, they like to mess with their heads. <laughs> it's not the uh, it's not the driest. There are three drier. Uh, Brut Nature, sometimes you hear Brut Nature or Extra Brut referred to as no dosage or no dose or no um, or uh, zero dosage. Sometimes we call them that. Um, the dosage, as we learned in an earlier question, that is the part, that's the, when we add the liqueur de expedition, that's where we're determining the sugar content. So if that liqueur has no sugar in it, 
then it would fit in that Breton Natur category, if you will, of that no dosage category. Um, Brut is very common. We see that a lot on wine lists. We see it a lot on the shelf. Um, oftentimes that may be your only, your driest choice for what your options are, either on a either in a store or on a wine list. You don't see Brut Natur as often or Brut, extra Brut. Um, and then extra dry is very, very common. And it's really not, I wouldn't call it sweet. It is sort of the sweetest of the dry styles, maybe you could say, uh, just has a, just a ever small titch of, uh, of sugar that you might notice. Okay, so good job for those who've got that in the right order. Okay, uh, name the production method used in the production of Franciacorta. Franciacorta. What do we think? Traditional method? Charmant method, tank method, Prosecco method. Traditional Charmant tank or Prosecco. What are we thinking here? What's the method for Francia Corta? Francia Corta, if you didn't know, is a sparkling wine from Italy. And Italy makes lots of different styles of sparkling wine in various methods. So it's a, it may be a guess for you. Traditional, Sharma, Tank, or Prosecco. Okay, so Christian tells me that you guys all got it right. It's traditional method. You are correct. Um, I, I did not write this question, but when I saw it on a so deck, I was pulling some quiz questions from. I had to laugh because Charmat tank and Prosecco method, well, there's really no such thing as the Prosecco method, uh, but all, but Charmat and tank are one and the same and Prosecco is most often made in the tank or uh, Charmat meth method. So bit of a trick question, but yes, very good. So most of you got the traditional method correct. Excellent. Okay, back to my fave, the V Clico. Uh, what's the translation of the word vive in Vive Clico Pont Sardin? Is it madam, company, widow, or owner? Vive Clico Pont Sardin. Is it madam? Does vive mean madam, company, widow, or owner? Some of those are interesting choices. And then I'm going to actually throw a pop quiz on here as well. So what do we think? Madam, company, widow, or owner? Viv in the Viv Clico. Okay, so for those of you who said widow, you are correct. It is actually widow. And we so often refer to her as Madame Clicquot, that I think sometimes that could be a little challenging. I am going to throw in a bonus question, though it's not in the deck, but uh, the word Ponsardon, I have to tell you, well, I'll tell you, I'll give you the question first. So just throw out what does the word Ponsardon refer to or mean, whichever you want to use. So it should be pretty simple to come up with why would, what, what that term Ponsardon, what does that mean? And, and the reason I bring this up is when I was taking my diploma class, my diploma exam for sparkling wines, this exact thing came up. And my my references to Vivico, I never had heard the term Pansardan before. I guess it wasn't something that stuck out to me on the label. And they wanted to know what that meant. And so I'm going to ask you, what does that mean? After I found out what it meant, and I got it wrong, by the way, I was like, oh my gosh, that was so obvious. I should, I could have guessed it. <laughs> None. Oh, I stumped you. Okay. Well, I feel your pain because I was completely stumped. I was like, oh my, I panicked when I saw it. It's actually her maiden name. It's Viv Clicquot, Madame Clicquot's maiden name, Pansadon. So remember that for you WSET students out there. You might get that on your exam. Okay. Which are the primary grapes used to make kava? Is it Maccabea, which is also known as Vera, Zrelo, Chardonnay, or Perilada? What do we think for making kava? So kava is a sparkling wine made in Spain. Maccabeo, Zrelo, Chardonnay, or Perilada? What do we think that is? Do we know? 
what the great varieties, which are the great varieties, and there's more than one answer, which are the great varieties? Macameo, Cerrillo, Chardonnay, Paralada. Okay, drum roll. The primary grapes are everything but Chardonnay. The Maccabeo, Zerelo, and Paralala are the, are the grapes made in Cava. Now, one more bonus question here. So when we're making Cava, which is a, a Spanish sparkling wine, is Cava required to be traditional method or tank method? What is required, traditional or tank method, to be called Cava or to be referred to as a Cava or to express Cava? What do we think? Traditional or tank? Okay, then we have some music going. Traditional or tank method for kava. What do we think? Okay, so I think we have a 50-50 split here. And actually, to be called kava, you must be made in the traditional method. Um, they do make sparkling wines in the tank method, but to be kava, it has to be traditional method. And by the way, um, Chardonnay can be used in making kava. They are starting to use more international grapes. It is just not considered one of the primary grapes. So um, the thing I like about kava is you can get a fantastic traditional method production sparkling wine for, you know, sometimes 10 or $15, um, which is always a little nicer than, say, a tank method American, you know, cooks or something like that. So for a few dollars more. I think kava is just such a great bargain. Uh, tends not to be as rich, of course, as sparkle as French champagne is complex, but it does have uh, it, it has lightness and bright acidity and just refreshing qualities to it. And great in uh, if you're going to blend it with something, blend this into juice. Don't blend fine champagne, please. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Okay, next on the agenda, which of these are true? about Asti, and there's more than, there could be more than one answer, maybe not. Is it a sparkling wine from the Veneto? Is it made from the Muscat grape? Is it made in the traditional method? Or is it always sweet? Which of these are true? And there could be more than one answer. Is it a sparkling wine from the Veneto, made from Muscat grapes, made in a traditional method, or always sweet? What are we thinking? Asti. We used to call it Asti Spumanti. We don't call it Spumanti technically anymore, only because it was sort of, um, it was a duplication of effort because the term Spumanti is a generic term in Italian that just means full sparkling. It means it's not, frizzante means partial spark sparkling and Spumanti means full sparkling. So it was sort of a redundant term. Asti is Asti. Okay, so the truth about Asti is that it is made from the Muscat grape and it is always made in a sweet style because the Muscat grape gives us that sweetness. It is not from the Veneto, which is in the northeast part of Italy. It is actually from the Piedmont region, which is in the northwest area, and it is from a town called Asti. So if, you, if it's called Asti, it has to be Moscato grapes. It has to be from the town of Asti. And if it just says Asti on the bottle, it is going to be the full Spumanti style. Now, you might find a wine that says um, Moscato de Asti, which is basically Moscato grapes from the town of Asti. But that wine is going to be what we call Frizzante, not Spumante. So it will have bubbles, but it's not going to have those long lived, you know, full on sparkling wine. And Asti is made in, it's a tank method, but it's really called the Asti method. It's a little, it's a little bit of a spin on the traditional tank method, but that's to retain all of its sweet, beautiful grapey flavor from the Muscat grape and tends to be lower alcohol. Okay. 
So uh, the, uh, the region of Champagne is broken up into several regions. So here's a list of four of them. Which one of these does not belong? Which is not a region in Champagne? Montagne de Rem, Côte de Noir, Côte de Blanc, or Côte de Cezanne? Which is not an official subregion of Champagne? Montagne de Rem, Côte de Noir, Côte de Blanc, or Côte de Cezanne? What do we think? <laughs> I think if you know the grape varietals that come from Champagne, this might be confusing. <laughs> and I always think of Cote de Cezanne as the name of a woman. B, good job. So you guys know it. Yeah, that could have been a trick question because, yeah, B is not the right answer, uh, is not part of subregion. The other three are. Um, I thought that was a little tricky because... We do use Pinot Noir, of course, in making uh, champagnes. Uh, Blanc, a, a wine called Blanc de Blanc is white of white, which would be Chardonnay. So that one kind of made more sense to me. But the Cote de Noir was a little bit of a trying to trick you kind of question. But you did good. You rose to the challenge and you, uh, you beat the teacher. So that's good. Excellent job. All righty, which one of these grape varietals are not allowed in champagne production? Which of these? And there's only one. Okay, so is it Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Gris, Arbois Blanc, Pinot Blanc, Petit Messier, or Arban? And I probably butchered a little bit of that pronunciation. I apologize to my French friends out there. <laughs> in Spanish, I'd have better luck, I think. Chardonnay, Pinot Noir, Pinot Meunier, Pinot Gris, Abois Blanc, Pinot Blanc, Petit Messier, or Arban. What do we... Okay. Uh, well, so um, I think I, this one was kind of a trick question. So let's do the reveal uh, to the next slide. It is the Arbois Blanc. Um, we do allow, they do allow for the other four, the P, of course, Chardonnay and Pinot, Pinot Noir is the number one grape. Pinot Meunier is also used, which we now mostly just refer to as Meunier. Chardonnay, of course, those are the three uh, grapes that when we think of Chardonnay, those are the ones we think of. But they are technically permitted to use Pinot Gris, Pinot Blanc, Petit Messier, and Arban. But Arbois Blanc, not so much. Okay? So... Good job. Okay, sparkling wine from Smur AC is normally made from this grape. Sparkling wine from Samur AC is normally made from this grape. Chenin Blanc, Cabernet Sauvignon, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, or Malon Blanc. So if you're not sure about this, I want you to think first about where Samur is. Where is it? It's, it's in France, I'll give you that much. Um, what is it near? What are the typical grape varieties for still wine grown in that region? And that might help you at least narrow it down a bit. Could eliminate a couple in there for you anyway. So is Samour normally made from Chenin, Cabernet, Sauvignon Blanc, Chardonnay, or Malone Blanc? Okay, so I understand that most of you got this one right. So Chenin Blanc is, in fact, the correct answer. So Samour is part of the Loire Valley, which, of course, was where Vouvray is made in the same general region. Of course, they're known for, for uh, Chenin Blanc. However, the Loire Valley also makes some Sauvignon Blanc in the Puy Fouy May area and in Sancerre. And then Malon Blanc is also made in uh, the town of Muscadet, and so that's a great use there. So if you only narrowed it down to Loire, you had three good choices, but it is in fact Chenin Blanc, so good job. Which sparkling wine is not made by the tank method? Prosecco, Moscato d'Asti, Cava, or Sect? Which sparkling wine is not made by tank method? Prosecco, Moscato d'Asti, Cava, or Sec? Now this one should be really easy, guys. I expect you all to get it right because we, in fact, have mentioned every single one of these and we've mentioned their production method. 
So let's see if you were paying attention. We didn't necessarily group them together, but we did mention each one of these. So what do we think? Prosecco, Moscato d'Asti, Cava or Sect? Very good, yeah. So we did talk about that earlier. Cava is required to be in the champagne, the traditional method. Um, so not, not a tank method, not permitted. Uh, Prosecco most often made in the tank method, but uh, from Valdo Biadene and uh, some of the more prestigious regions, Cartice, you might find, you will find occasionally some uh, traditional method production. But in most cases, most inexpensive Proseccos, volume Proseccos are meant to be fruity and lively and fruit forward. So wouldn't necessarily want to use the traditional method. Um, Moscato Dosti, as I said, it's a form of a tank method and sect is always a tank method. Now we're at Deutscher sect, it could be either as we talked about earlier. Okay, good job. Riddling, this came up a little bit earlier, Madame Clicquot invented this, is riddling the addition of sugar, turning the bottle to remove the dead yeast, the addition of yeast, or disgorging the yeast. So what does riddling do? What is it? Is it the addition of sugar? Is it turning the bottle to remove the dead yeast? Is it the addition of yeast or disgorging the dead yeast? So what do we think? Adding sugar, turning the bottle, adding yeast or disgorging? Those are your choices. Of course, there's a beautiful picture of a man doing riddling here. We don't do it very often by hand anymore, except for the tourists. We do it for them. In most cases, we're using a, a piece of equipment called a gyro pallet. Yes, you are correct. And this is sort of the beginnings of carpal tunnel. In my opinion, I have a feeling these people had a lot of carpal tunnel. So basically, we, uh, when we add the liqueur de tirage and we put the, the cap on the bottle to let the yeast uh, and sugar mingle and the yeast is going to, uh, is going to eat the sugar, uh, the yeast is going to sink to the bottom and die once there's no more sugar in the bottle. And you have to find a way to get it out. And so what you do is you take the bottle and you put the cap on it and you lay it on its side. And then over the pro this is after the secondary fermentation is complete. Then over the course of, well, if you're doing it by hand several weeks, you're going to tap that bottle and turn it about a quarter turn, but tip it up a little bit. And then you're going to keep coming back to it and tapping and turning and tipping it up even more and even more till eventually the bottle is upside down. And what, what it's doing is it's coaxing that dead gunk, that yeasty gunk in the bottle. It's coaxing it into the neck so that when the wine is ready to be you know, finished, we can freeze that bottle, that neck bottle up while it's upside down and freeze that plug of yeast, pop that little cap off. The plug of yeast shoots out. Then we add that liqueur de expedition that we talked about to create the sweetness level. Then we put the final cork and the cage on top of the bottle. So it is to remove the yeast. All right, which French wine does not make a cremant? Which, I'm sorry, which French wine region does not make a cremant? Is it Bourgogne, Loire, Alsace, or Champagne? What are we thinking here? Okay, who does not make a cremant? Bourgogne, Loire, Alsace, Champagne. Okay, now there's a couple seconds for the big reveal. Okay. Okay. So this was kind of a trick question. <laughs> so the answer is champagne. Champagne uh, does not make a cremant. In fact, uh, the, the whole reason that we use the word cremant is because it is a traditional method production for sparkling wines in seven designated regions outside of Champagne. So places like Loire and Alsace and Bourgogne and even Bordeaux, they can have an, you know, a, a uh, Bourgogne to Alsace, so, uh, you know, I'm sorry, 
a Bourgogne de Cremant, an Alsace de Cremant. Um, these are really beautiful wines made in the traditional method. They do not have to use champagne grapes, however, they're not limited. They actually more often use the champagne or the grapes that are grown mostly in their region. So you could use, for instance, in Alsace, you could use um, Pinot Blanc, if you'd like. Uh, in Loire, it's, we talked about that earlier, you could use Chenin Blanc, you could use Sauvignon Blanc. In Bourgogne, of course, you're going to use Chardonnay. So if you're looking for a value on bubbles and you still want that French sort of feel and you want the traditional method, look for a Cremant. They're lovely, lovely wines at a bargain compared to Champagne. Okay. Uh, well, I gave you the answer on this one, but I'll, I'll throw it out there anyway. Let's see if you were listening. So what method of production is you, is used for producing the, uh, a Cremant Alsace, which is a Cremant from Alsace, that little D apostrophe means from. So which production method, tank, traditional, transfer, or carbon dioxide? God forbid. <laughs> this is an easy one. What are we thinking? Okay, what are we thinking here? Tank, tradition, transfer, or carbon dioxide. There ought to be laws against D. <laughs> okay, good. Uh, so the answer is traditional method. And yes, we just talked about that. The word cremant is actually referring to the fact that it is a traditional method, sparkling wine in France outside of the, um, the Champagne area, but only in, in designated areas. All right, so I think this is our last question. Christian, is this the right, is this right? Is this the last question? Okay, so this is just a simple true or false. So when you're opening a bottle of sparkling wine, you should always keep the metal cage on the bottle. Is that true or is it false? How many of you take the cage off when you're opening your bottle of sparkling wine? Or do you keep your cage on? What do you think? Lots of schools of thought on this, but there is an official answer. Keeping the cage on or taking the cage off before you open it. True or false. Okay, so I'm told that uh, it's a it's a crapshoot as to which way we're going here. So we always, always want to keep the metal cage on the bottle throughout the process. And you'll see here in this picture, there's that little tab. So here's a little sort of parlor game or, you know, bar game you could play for fun. If, first of all, when you're open, when you get to this point where you've taken the foil off, I recommend putting a napkin, cloth napkin, over the top of the bottle because once you start loosening that cage, that that cork is under so much pressure that it could break a light, it could put somebody's eye out, it could really do some serious damage. So put a cloth over. But you see that little tab, you're going to pull that tab down. And if you turn that tab six times, six half turns, just one, two, three, four, five, six toward you, six quick half turns, that will um, undo that piece of it. And then you just wiggle it. And you're going to let it, I'm going to, I can't really show you here in the screen, forget it. Um, but you're going to wiggle it and just loosen the bottom of that cage that you can see is underneath that lip. You want to, you have to loosen it enough to get it underneath the lip. Now, the whole time you're doing this with one hand, let's say I'm right-handed, so I'm going to be doing it with my right hand. I'm going to have my left hand over the top of the bottle with my thumb firmly on that cork um, or actually on the cloth that's over the cork and I'm holding it down so that when I finally start to turn the bottle, I'm, I'm holding that cage with my napkin and turning the bottle. This way, the cage is giving you grip on that cork and it's helping you release that cork just ever so slightly. Um, turning the bottle, always not the cork. So it, keeping that cage on is what gives you grip. So anyway, Hopefully that's a helpful tip for you. Well, you were full of tips today. That was amazing. I tried. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully everyone had fun out there. Uh, 
again, you, you did make Monday Fun Day, this trivia. Uh, and thanks so much for everyone uh, for answering and being uh, active participants in this trivia. Again, every Monday here at 2 p.m. Uh, Pacific Daylight Time, we'll be doing Monday Fun Day trivia, wine trivia. Karen, thanks so much for hosting this week. Uh, really Thank good, you. Really good questions. And, and we look forward to having you back real soon. Sounds good. Okay. See you all. Bye. See you here next Monday. Cheers. Bye.